So the question of trying to know if one can test different quantum gravity models is a very exciting one, because when I was a student in physics, not that long ago, I mean quantum gravity was nearly metaphysics. It was metaphysics with mathematics, so not real metaphysics, but still it was believed to be completely impossible to test. And I think the situation changed. Right now, nearly every single model of quantum gravity has some predictions. None of them has been explicitly checked or verified or even falsified at that time. But still, it's very, very exciting that we are trying to make contact between quantum gravity on the one hand and experiments or observations on the other hand. So let's uh, begin with the king, with string theory. I mean, string theory is a fundamental theory of nature that could be a theory of everything, which, which um, unifies all interactions, all particles, including, of course, the nice prediction of quantum gravity. So string theory is often said to be untestable. And I think it is unfair, because actually quantum gravity makes prediction a quite Ironically or cynically, one could say that old predictions are already excluded. For example, you predict extra dimensions. Of course, this does not falsify string theory, because it could be that extra dimensions are very small, they are compact compactified, and therefore you just don't see them. Then, string theory predicts supersymmetry. You need superstrings. But we don't see supersymmetry around us. The LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, has already excluded supersymmetry in its simplest version. Of course, it does not falsify string theory, because it just could be that the scale for supersymmetry is too high, and we don't see it. Then string theory predicts so-called non-Gaussianity in the cosmological microwave background. This is just a strange kind of statistics. We don't see non-Gaussianities. But still, it does not falsify string theory, because it could be that one field is more important than the others. And finally, string theory predicts that space should be anti de Sitter. It means that we should have a negative cosmological constant. Unfortunately, we have measured a positive cosmological constant. But still, this does not falsify string theory, because there are ways to get around that. Right now, the situation is very, very exciting because string theorists are looking deeper into the vacua, that is the stable point, of the theory. And the very nice proposal uh, has been recently um, put on the market by Vafa. So this is a controversial issue. Not all string theorists agree with him. Very far from that. But it is exciting because his proposal is the following. The key point is that in string theory, either cosmological constant is negative, and we are happy, but this is not what happens in the real world, or it is positive, but in that case, the energy density should decrease faster than a certain rate. And it seems that this bound has been violated during the inflation in the early universe, and might be again violated in the contemporary evolution of the universe. So if Vafa is right, which is not sure at all. It might be that string theory is in tension with what we see, but this is, this is very elegant, very nice, because it does not rely on the super high energy particle colliders. It just relies on the observation of galaxies with a telescope. So, obviously, this is not the end of the story. But obviously, string theory people are now trying to make clear prediction about the actual expanding rate of the universe, and it might be that the theory will be falsified in the future just because it is impossible to construct a stable de Sitter vacuum. So that's exciting, because we are really making predictions, and it's not impossible that the theory is either falsified or deeply modified just to account for the observed expansion of the universe. I think the main contender to string theory is loop quantum gravity. Loop quantum gravity is not a theory of everything. It is just a theory of quantum gravity, but this is still huge, because this has been an open problem in physics for nearly a century now. So in loop quantum gravity, you try not to make any extra assumption, but instead just to use what we already know well in physics. So on the one hand, we have general relativity to describe gravity, and on the other hand, we have quantum mechanics to describe microscopic systems. Bringing them together, 
le leads to this framework, which seems to be mathematically very well defined, and which is quite impressive in the sense that it has been recovered through quite a lot of different approaches. Right now, it leads to clear predictions for black holes and for the early universe, and this might allow to test the theory. So basically, in the cosmological sector, what happens is that you don't have anymore a Big Bang, but instead you expect a big bounce, which means that there should be a contracting phase of the universe before the current expanding phase of the universe. And this might leave footprints in the so-called primordial power spectrum, which is precisely what experimentalists right now observe in the uh, microwave background thanks to satellites. So we might have predictions that will be tested in the next decade. On the other hand, we also predict in the black hole sector that the so-called Hawking evaporation spectrum should be modified by quantum gravity effects. This is slightly harder to observe because we have never seen an evaporating black hole, but still, this is not hopeless. So a very interesting uh, proposal was made a few decades ago by Alan Cohn called non-commutative geometry. Well, basically, the idea is to import what was learned from quantum mechanics. In usual physics, observables commute. It means that you don't care about the order in which you make different measurements. In the quantum setting, this is not true anymore. If you measure position and then momentum, it is not the same thing as doing the very same measurement, but the other way around. Alan Cohn was able to formalize those ideas in the framework of mathematical algebras, and this led to very interesting uh, deformation of our understanding of space in itself. This has predictions for particle physics, for example, that are right now in agreement with what we see, but this also leads to very interesting predictions for gravity and for the universe. Specifically, the so-called spectral action, which is a way to take into account at the mathematical physics level what was understood from non-commutative geometry, you expect the inflationary parameters, the so-called slow roll parameters, which describe the way the universe has expanded just after the Big Bang, to be slightly different from what happens in the usual setting. So the very detailed study of inflation that we are right now able to make thanks to measurements in the cosmological microwave background might tell us if non-commutative geometry ideas are correct. In addition, they predict a kind of multifractality of space which might have imprints on the way galaxies are distributed in space. To the best of my knowledge, it's not yet clear in this framework what happens, for example, to black holes when they end up the Hawking evaporation or to the universe at the Big Bang time. Probably it's a bit too early to be conclusive on that point in this framework. Another interesting proposal is causal sets. Causal sets relies on the idea that space is fundamentally discrete, that is, discontinuous, and in this framework you just implement at a very fundamental level a so-called partial order relation. Partial order means that you put somehow by hand causality. The very nice view is that in this framework one can say that order plus number gives you geometry. So this is really the way geometry emerges from the causal set viewpoint. Interestingly enough, this is, to my knowledge, the only theory of quantum gravity that has been able to make a prediction that has been confirmed after. And this was a very nice prediction about the value of the cosmological constant. We know now that there is in our universe a cosmological constant which is positive, non-vanishing, but extremely small. And impressi impressively, in causal sets, they were able to predict this extremely strange and tiny value of the cosmological constant before it was measured. Of course, it's not a proof that the theory is correct, it's very far from that, but at least this is a very good point in favor of this theory. The other interesting point is that some ideas, for example, the fact that black holes could be baby universes, 
as proposed by Lee Smolin, can be implemented and formalized in a very mathematically rigorous way into the framework of causal sets. So it translates a kind of well-known physical problem into a very well-defined mathematical problem. So once again, it can make bridge between observations and the fundamental theory. So this idea uh, is not from causal sets, right? This is another idea coming from Lee Smolin. Uh, in this proposal, one might assume that each universe creates baby universes through the black holes that it creates. So each created black hole would be a kind of baby universe, and therefore you might have a kind of Darwinian selection of the universe because the more uh, the laws of physics are favorable to the production of black hole, the more this kind of universe will self replicate. So this is a very interesting alternative to the anthropic uh, principle and the multiverse. But the key point is that at this stage, this is a very theoretical idea. And in the framework of causal sets, you can really implement technically this idea and check if it is consistent at the mathematical level. So another interesting approach to quantum gravity is called uh, asymptotic safety. The idea comes from Weinberg, Nobel Prize laureate for particle physics, and the idea is quite simple. You know, in physics, quite often we have infinities appearing in the calculation, and we can get rid of infinities thanks to renormalization. We just have one free parameter that we fix thanks to experiment. The problem is that it seems not to work in gravity because you would need to fix infinitely many parameters and therefore you cannot make any concrete predictions. This is a failure of the usual way to quantize gravity. And the idea by Weinberg and his colleagues is that maybe actually it works. It works because you might not need to fix infinitely many parameters, but just a large number. And a large number is not a big problem for the, from the theoretical viewpoint. So basically it means that one might hope that gravity works as well in the ultraviolet, that is for high energies, that it works in the infrared, that is for low energies. And this is implemented through techniques called renormalization group flows that are very well mastered at the mathematical level. Interestingly enough, this proposal leads to experimental consequences. For example, you would expect in the Transplancian regime, that is at very, very high energies, that the Newton constant, which fixes the intensity of gravitation, to be now a running parameter, which means that it highly depends on energy. This will induce a cutoff, cutoff scale in astrophysical observations that might be observable in the future. Also, when you look at the effective gravitational theory that would be predicted in this framework, the action is not anymore just the Ricci scalar, that is general relativity, but a function of this Ricci scalar. So it means that it is more complicated, and it's very fortunate because we know how to make calculations in this framework. So we know how it will change, for example, gravitational waves or the cosmological behavior of the universe. So this is something that could be checked in the near future. So causal dynamical triangulations is a very interesting proposal for quantum gravity in the sense that it assumes a discrete structure of space uh, by generalizing the notion of a triangle. You know, a triangle is something which lives in two dimensions. You can generalize this triangle idea by going to higher dimensions, and this is called a simplex. So basically, causal dynamical triangulation is a theory about the spontaneous deterministic evolution of simplices, that is, generalization of triangles in higher dimension. At this stage, I don't think that it leads to very clear prediction for the Big Bang or bouncing black holes or things like that, but it predicts something else which is very interesting and in agreement with what we observe in the universe, it predicts that we should live in a De Sitter universe. De Sitter universe means a positive cosmological constant, and this is exactly what we observe, and this is rarely something which is predicted in quantum gravity. So the fact that at its very basic level, the theory seems to lead to this De Sitter structure which is indeed observed, and for very deep reasons that, I, that are highly non-perturbative, which means really rooted in the theory itself, 
is something which is quite interesting for the, um, for the consistency of the model. So, order by Lifshitz uh, model is an interesting proposal for quantum gravity, which solves uh, some technical and conceptual issues by assuming that at very high energy, space and time are not equivalent anymore. This is something very fundamental because this is a known problem in quantum gravity that on the one hand the quantum theory doesn't treat space and time on the same footing, but on the other hand, relativity tells us that space and time are the same thing. So in order of a leaf sheet's gravity, one can calculate what happens uh, to the structure of space-time. And to the best of my knowledge, the most interesting results are happening in the black hole sector, where very interesting developments were made, allowing one to compute the so-called entropy of black hole, which is a great mystery of physics, from first principle and shedding therefore a new light of this big, on this big uh, enigma.